Welcome into Sports Memo's Betting Podcast, College Basketball Conference Tournament Edition with Mid Major Matt. Mid Major Matt, welcome to the pod. How you doing? Doing great, Drew. Conference tournament time, fantastic time for everybody. And then, of course, that's the appetizer for the big tournaments, the NCAA, the NIT, the CBI, and the CIT. I'm really excited about this stuff. Yeah, man, this is right up your wheelhouse. You know a lot about these teams, and uh, I'm sure, did, did your volume of bets go up around this time of year? I would say, I mean, I'm more selective. And also, obviously, when we've got, and we're going to talk about this on the podcast, a lot of these games don't get lines until the morning of. So there's a little bit of a, hey, I like it here, not here. Um, but yeah, definitely. And more, I'll say this, more of my bets potentially will go on the NIT, the CBI, and the CIT. It's not to say I won't bet in the NCAA tournament. But to me, I think those smaller tournaments have a lot more value. Who wants to be there? Who doesn't want to be there? How good's the home crowd? Who's playing on the road and stuff like that? But yeah, I definitely think you'll see more plays for me these next couple of weeks. Oh, man. Uh, excited to get your opinion here on the uh, Thursday card. We got, uh, we're, we're actually talking on Wednesday night, guys, but we got four or five games picked out here. We'll get a best bet from mid-major Matt as well. Uh, some of the games we're talking about do have lines as we're talking about them. Some of them don't, so we'll do a little guessing lines with mid-major Matt. But uh, starting off the regular board here, Matt, we got, uh, what, 665, 666, the rotation numbers here. Houston, that's 21st ranked Houston at Connecticut. We got 133 and a half, minus two, that's Houston laying on the road. Um, any opinion here and getting involved in this AAC matchup? Well, we talk about every week a live betting situation. This game, to me, screams a live betting situation. When you look at these two squads, we'll start out with Houston. Houston is number two in the country when it comes to offensive rebound percentage. They rebound almost 39% of their misses. Um, they're really good defensively. 15th against the two, ninth against the three. They don't play very fast. 301st in offensive pace. Their average possession time is 18.6 seconds. Now, the road has been somewhat unkind to them, uh, but if you go closer. They lost by two at Tulsa. They lost by two at Cincinnati. They lost by one in overtime at SMU. They lost them by one at Memphis uh, in conference play. You look at UConn. It's a very hard team to figure out. UConn has these spurts where they look like a really good basketball team, and then there's these spurts where you're like, what the heck is going on? They've won six of their last eight. They've got home wins over Temple, Cincinnati, Memphis, USF, and UCF in conference. Uh, they also have a couple of overtime losses at home to Tulsa and Wichita State. They're not great offensively, but against the two they are 29th overall so to me we go back to the first meeting between these two Houston who has been absolutely dominant at home this season only won 63 59 in a 74 possession game guarantee you we will not see 74 possessions if this game uh, you know there's a chance I guess if it goes into overtime we could see that many but in regulation no shot that we see 74 possessions between these two teams digging into the numbers a little bit both of those teams shot terribly from two-point land they also didn't shoot very well from three either UConn was out rebounded 42 to 33 Houston had 19 turnovers so there was a couple of anomaly numbers there the reason why I say this is a good live betting situation is I kind of want to get a feel for the game. How tight are the officials calling the game? These are two teams who like to bang inside. They've got a lot of, uh, a lot of beef. They've got a lot of uh, interior presences. If it's a tightly called game, then the over might be worth a look by, by virtue of a lot of free throws. If it's a game that they're letting go a little bit, if there's not a lot of fouls, if, if nobody's really in foul trouble, then I might look to bet this thing in game. First glance, it seems like an under. Uh, it seems like an under at 132.5, but I'd rather watch a little bit of this game, get a feel for what's going on, because you know the, the joy and the beauty of in-game betting is you're not betting tw uh, 40 minutes of game, you're betting 30 minutes a game, 20 minutes a game if you bet in halftime, depending upon where you jump in. And and you have some knowledge about what's going on that Vegas didn't have the night before. So I lean to the under here, but I mostly think that this is an uh, in-game live situation. Um, I don't know if you've looked at this game at all, Drew, but with the numbers and how good these guys are defensively, doesn't this seem like an under type game? Yeah, it does. I mean, I, I actually like both of these two teams, you know, to make a little run here in March. Um, and I, I like where you were going with that in terms of in-game live in, in, in the how the fouls are being called. Um, it's actually something I would recommend, you know, I, I would look personally to kind of using that in my arsenal in, in terms of totals betting as well in game and how it's being called because the refs have so much to do with, uh, the, the, the totals market in college basketball. I mean, if they're calling fouls all over that game, you know, 90% of games are going to go skyrocketing over with a foul fest at the end, anything like that. So, uh, 
Yeah, man, like where your head's at, and we're actually seeing it 133 and a half as we're talking right now. Now, there are some 132 and a halves so in, in the marketplace, so a little opinion here. Um, it looks like at least a couple bets off the opener to the over, Matt. Yeah, and as I said, I don't see a 74 possession game like they had the first time around, and even more, they had 74 possessions, and the game was 122 points. And so, to me, I think the 122 points is more likely than the 74 possessions. If they get to that number again, it's probably going to go over. But then again, I, I think this is this is your prototypical rock fight here. I think that, and the reason why I'm not telling Houston, even though I love Houston, you know, as a better team. I just can't trust UConn. We've seen UConn this year when they've looked really good. So, therefore, that's another reason why I want to do in-game. If UConn looks like they're clicking and you can get a good number in-game on the Huskies, then I would potentially uh, consider taking them in this game. All right, good stuff to start off in the AAC. Guys, we're going uh, kind of off the regular rotation here, but 707-708, Oakland at Wisconsin, Green Bay. This is Thursday matchup here, 5 o'clock Eastern time. And uh, mid-major, Matt, I'll throw it over to you because the odds makers have not come out with numbers, both sides and totals as of right now, Wednesday night. But uh, what would you look to bet in terms of uh, at, at the open here, Oakland versus Wisconsin Green Bay? Well, I said, and I I threw a little bit down on, I think Green Bay has a real shot to win this conference. I know Wright State and Northern Kentucky are the favorites, but I really like what Green Bay has. Here's some of the numbers about the Phoenix. Seventh quickest tempo in the country. They have the shortest offensive possession time at 14.5 seconds. So they go, they go, go, go. They're 22nd in three-point shooting and 301st in three-point defense. So you would lean to the over here. Now remember, this is the Horizon Conference. This round will be played in campus sites. So Green Bay is home for this one. The rounds after this, the semifinals and the finals, are going to be played in Indianapolis, I believe. So therefore, there will be more of a neutral court presence. But Green Bay's home in this one. Um, they've won six of their last eight. One of those losses came to Oakland. We'll get into that in a second. When you look at the Golden Grizzlies team, 284th quickest pace, 320th longest possession time at 18.9 seconds. So they're more methodical on offense. But they're not very good at offense. 324th and three-point shooting. Um, they are coming off a win Tuesday night against Cleveland State at home, 80-59 to in the first round of this Horizon League tournament. They're playing good basketball right now. Six of their last seven they've won. Five of those have come at home. They do have a couple of wins in, uh, in Horizon League play on the road. But, Drew, uh, I'm looking here at Ken Palm. And we, you know, I, we know that Vegas loves to base their lines off of Ken Palm. Mm -hmm. And they've got this game as a 79-75 win for the Phoenix. I really like Green Bay in this game. I'm hoping for less than four. I'm hoping it's three. I'm hoping it's two and a half. I don't think we'll get that. I would be willing to wait, although by the time this podcast comes out, it'll be the morning, and hopefully the lines will be out early. I think Green Bay has a shot to win this conference. And if you go back and look at the two matchups here between the two teams, they played February 23rd at Oakland. It was a two-overtime game. Unfortunately, I had Green Bay plus three in that game. They lost by four, 92 to 88. It was a 90-possession game, but of course it was two overtimes. Green Bay had a 10-point halftime lead. Xavier Hill May for uh, Oakland had 31 points. Go back even further, January 16th at Green Bay, the Phoenix won 73-69. It was a 74-possession game. Both teams shot well from two-point land, but from three, they combined for 15 for 54, which is to expected because Oakland's really bad at it at 324th overall. Uh, to me, I think the numbers are going to be relatively crucial here. If we can get closer to 150, and if we can get Green Bay minus three or so, I'm looking at the Phoenix here, and I would even consider potentially a money line bet if you're willing to swallow the juice there. Now, of course, if it's you know if it's minus three and it's minus 160, then of course that's uh, you know personal preference there. I definitely the thing I like the most is I think Green Bay wins this game. Uh, anything above four and a half or five, I don't necessarily love it because Oakland's going to try and slow this game down. Uh, the over under. If it's closer to 150, I kind of like the over here. You look at the possession times that this team has had this season, they're going to regularly push 70. As I said, they even pushed, they had 75 at home against Oakland the first time around. Uh, if this is going to be a close game, you get late fouling involved. So I really like Green Bay to win this game. The shorter the number, the better. Uh, if you want to take the money line, go ahead. And I like the over here, but depending upon where it is, because it's going to hang around that 150 number, maybe let the number come out have some people bet it down a little bit, get it to a more manageable number, and then jump in on the over there. Makes total sense here, Mid-Major Matt. And guys, uh, follow him on Twitter, at Mid-Major Matt. Coupon code for the podcast. 
DM49 takes $70 off one week all access at sportsmemo.com. Mid-Major Matt, man, he is a great choice, especially this time of year, knowing all this information about all these small schools, conference tournament time uh, this next week. Great time to jump on board. Sportsmemo.com. Mid-Major Matt, 55% over the last, what, four months. So, uh, Net- yeah. January 9th. Uh, January 9th. So, uh, okay. Uh, 55% is still uh, very solid there, mid-major, Matt, and it's a good time to jump on his uh, service. So, guys, coupon code DM49 at checkout. Next game up here. This is uh, not a regular rotation game, guys, so you're going to have to search around for it. The rotation number 308-2773, Charleston Southern at Radford. So it's going to be uh, limited bets here, but, uh, heck, you can still cash these tickets, mid-major, Matt. No lineup right now, but... uh, what, 8 a.m. Pacific, 7.30 a.m. Pacific, they likely will be up for these conference tournaments. So we got Charleston Southern at Radford. Any opinion here? So the key here is it is at Radford because this is the Big South tournament, and this round, every game is going to be at Radford. So when we talk about our next game after this, that game will also be played there. And then if um, – Radford loses, then we'll go to the next highest seed, which I believe is Winthrop, and if they lose, and so on and so forth. So for now, these next two rounds, they're going to be played at Radford, whether they're in the tournament or not. Championship game will be played either at Radford or the best seed remaining. So the key here is this. You've got a Radford team that I really like, and they're coming off a loss in their last home game, which means you're going to get them in an extremely focused spot here. They are lost 70-62 to Gardner-Webb. Uh, some of the particulars for this team, 337th in adjusted tempo, 300. 36 in average possession length. So 19.5 seconds per possession is what they're averaging right now, and they're really effective. 52nd in two point percentage, 73rd in three point percentage. The one weakness I would say for them is they are 339th in free throw percentage, which would help a potential under. They don't turn the ball over. The problem is they don't force a lot of turnovers. Uh, you look at their opponent, they're playing Charleston Southern, a team that they've seen just once so far this season. They met at Radford. Radford won 77-74 in overtime in a 69-possession game, which is interesting because 69 possessions over, what is that? That's 45 minutes or so. So that's a really slow game with an overtime. Uh, it was 67 all before overtime began. Radford shot 66.7% from two-point land, but they missed eight free throws. Goes along with the fact that they can't shoot free throws very well. Radford won the boards 40 to 28 in that game. You look at Charleston Southern, they are 244th in tempo, 229th in average possession length. Their two point defense is hideous, 325th. They do have three wins on the road in conference, but none of them are as high or as good as Radford. They won at Campbell, High Point, and Gardner Webb. None, none of those teams are exactly threats in this conference. Ken Palm's predicting about a 74 62 type game. When you look at this Radford team, they've had a mixed bag at home. They've played a couple of close games at home, and then they've played some blowouts at home. So to me, I'm potentially looking at Charleston Southern plus the points here. And the reason why is if this is somehow a tight game, you look at Radford's poor free throw shooting, and it comes into play. If Radford can't salt this game away late with free throws, then I think Charleston Southern can hang around here. Now, the problem is if this is a blowout, free throws aren't going to exactly matter. The total, according to this, would be 136. That seems a little high to me for two uh, – Uh, slower-paced teams. Probably won't touch the total here, but I'll be interested to see when this number comes out. Uh, It's going to be in the double digits, probably. Uh, I'll be interested to see, A, how the market moves it, because, I mean, I probably won't be up when it first comes out. And two, I'll be interested to see if other people subscribe to the fact that Radford's poor free-throw shooting could keep Charleston Southern around. And, um, And, you know, it depends on the number tomorrow. Obviously, when you watch this podcast, it'll hopefully be out. At at maybe like 13 or above, I'm considering Charleston Southern here. Radford's going to get the win because they're home, but their poor free throw shooting at times has had had them not be able to put teams away, and that's why I think Charleston Southern might be worth a look here uh, in this game. I like where your head's at, Mid-Major Matt, especially because as we get down here to, you know, uh, one and done, pretty much you lose and your season's over for some of these two teams, so... I'm I'm expecting, and I remember this last year having this mentality. It worked out to some degree. Teams will start fouling a little bit earlier, you know, down eight, nine points, and add on to that, you know, with them being a bad free throw shooting team, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but it actually might compound for Charleston Southern knowing that and fouling even earlier. So I, that that could really extend the game, man. 
So I'm looking at their team. Now, their best, the player of the year in the conference was Carly Jones. He's an 81% free throw shooter. Okay. Another guard, Travis Fields, is 69.9. Donald Hicks, uh, but he's only taken 26 free throws. He's 57%. Divine EK, I'm guessing is how he says it. He's taken 106 free throws, made only 41, so he's a 38.7% wow. free throw though, shooter. No, he's a six foot eight forward, and I'm guessing he's probably out of the game by that time anyway. There are several other guys who don't shoot free throws very well, but really it's Jones and Fields who are good free throw shooters. They've taken the most, but it's a lot of fringe peripheral guys who aren't very good. So I'm guessing EK is going to be out, but if it's a close game and they need his offense potentially, um, he's at 65% from two point land. So close game, Drew, they might foul him. Uh, blowout, he's probably not in there. So that's something to watch as well, um, is if they're in a close game. They're going to have to play this kid, and then the free throws come in to play. Yeah. No, it's a big part of the handicap. And uh, what next game up here? We got 308 275, the rotation here, guys. Going a little bit off the road. Uh, Hampton, Longwood. And we got, a num we got numbers up on this. We got Longwood minus three. Not at home, though. This one is at Radford, right, Matt? This one is at Radford, and, and Drew will attest to this. I mean, if you guys have followed me on my page, pretty much every game the last couple months, we've taken the over on Hampton. It's been quite incredible to watch. They have a pace that is just absolutely ridiculous. I mean, it's only 49th in the country, but they don't turn the ball over. Jermaine Marrow, who is he's their good. guard, who missed a couple of games, he's really good. By the way, fact for you, he's the all-time leading scorer now in Division One history for a Virginia school. He passed Reggie Williams who people from the NBA may be familiar with from VMI. Reggie Williams was the all-time leading scorer for any Virginia schools. Now it's Jermaine Marrow. Him and Ben Stanley are a great duo. Ben Stanley inside is very tough to handle. Hampton actually, look, I, I, I don't think they're going to win the tournament, but I thought it was pretty crazy. I saw on some sports books they were like 60-1 to 1 to win the tournament, which I thought was ridiculous because Hampton, look, their defense is terrible, but their offense is very good. I'm not saying, and it's probably gone now because the tournament's already begun, but 60-1 to 1 for Hampton to win the tournament. Longwood on the other end. Longwood doesn't want to run. They're 191st in tempo, 306th in defensive average possession length. So the teams have to work to find open shots against Longwood. Now, they're not very good offensively either. 334th in two-point percentage. Uh, and they're better at three-point shooting, 98%, uh, 98th in three-point percentage. They won four straight, seven of their last nine. Let's take a look at the last two meetings because for this – Quick tempo versus slow tempo, who's won? Well, the game in Longwood back on February 15th uh, was a 76-68 Lancers win in 68 possessions. So the one hand, it was a total of 144 and a 68 possession game. You look, Marrow and Stanley combined for 42 points. Lancers came at them with five guys with double figures. We go to the game at Hampton. Now, this is almost two months ago on January 11th. Hampton 183 80, 77 possessions. And we've talked about this often in the podcast, and it's something a lot of us believe in. If you're a slower paced team, it's hard for you to establish that pace on the road. Marrow and Stanley had 46 in that game. And once again, Longwood had five Lancers in double figures. To me, it's Longwood minus three, and the over-under is 149. As you said, it's going down a little bit. I actually think if we get a chance to see this thing go down a little bit more, I might jump in on the over here. The one worry is, besides Longwood's poor offense, is this is a new court for both of them. Well, it's not really new. They played there once. When you look at... Um, when you look at these two teams, obviously they've played at Radford once. I'm trying to pull up what Radford did in those games. Hampton at Radford, and this is something that you look at. Hampton won, uh, lost 81-78 at Radford. So they scored some points, and they had some success. They just didn't win the game. Longwood at Radford played a 67-55 game, so their offense wasn't very good, but that's kind of the expected score when you play Radford. So you kind of have to look at these offenses and see how they do because it's a new surrounding for them. They only played once. But to me, Drew, I kind of like Hampton in this game, plus the points. I'm going to wait and see if we can get a little bit more out of it. I don't necessarily like it as much as three. If we can get three and a half or four, maybe it goes up a little bit because people see how hot Longwood's been lately. I think Hampton's a very live dog here and if they win this game and they get a little bit of momentum they can make things interesting for Radford it should both teams move on um, so what I uh, advise doing when you watch this podcast see if it goes down a little bit we've seen some Hampton games go down total wise a little bit lately because people are like well they can't keep this up well they kind of have kept it up 
See if it keeps going down a little bit, then jump in on the over. See if Hampton maybe goes up from three a little bit, and we jump in on Hampton here, because I think they're a very live dog in this one, as I thought that they had a small chance to win this tournament outright. Hampton to the over has been money this year, mid-major, Matt. Is Hampton going to make it into a, uh, a postseason tournament here? No, unfortunately, they are 13 and 18. I think part of that was Jermaine Marrow only played 22 games of the 31. And I think if he had played more, I'm trying to remember the stretch. I mean, they lost to Richmond without him. They lost to Howard without him. They lost to Southern Illinois without him. I'd love to see them keep playing, mostly because they're a lot of fun. And Jermaine Marrow is a senior, so this is going to be his last go round here. But I don't think, I think this could be the last game, although I think that they're going to win or cover. Uh, just for sake, uh, Ken Palm has this game being a 76-75 Longwood win, which would cover the three and uh, would go over that total. But I'm interested to see the line movement when we get up in the morning. Uh, obviously, here's my one thing about line movement when it comes to these games. I'm always leery about huge line movement, quick drops, things like that, because people who bet on these games are people like me who know a lot about these games. So when you talk about sharps and squares, Sharps bet on these games and move lines like this. So if you see a big line by the time you watch this podcast, definitely be a little bit worried here in terms of somebody maybe knowing something, somebody being uber confident. It's a little different than an ACC game where a sharp doesn't move the line as much because I think a lot of people know about the ACC. Not a ton of people know about the Big South. Makes total sense. Good information there from mid-major, Matt. We got uh, one more game here, Matt, and then uh, maybe open it up a little bit and best bets as well. So, guys, feel free to reach out on Twitter at mid-major, Matt, at Drew Martin Betts. Uh, going forward, mid-major, Matt, will be on the pod twice a week. So uh, throughout March Madness and Major League Baseball as well, we'll get his opinion on a lot going forward. So feel free to throw out any questions you want answered on the podcast. We got Stetson and Liberty up next. Uh, Liberty Flames. Matt, tell us about this game. All right, so Liberty is the home team in this one. And you can honestly say before they lost that last game of the regular season to Lipscomb, Stetson was the reason why Liberty wasn't in the mix for a at-large bid because they were one of the last undefeated teams in the country. They went all the way back to December 29th. Their first loss was 74-57 at LSU. And look, I really like this Liberty team. You know, it's 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 you know chic to pick an upset in the in a conference tournament. I think Liberty is going to be the champion here. I think North Florida and Liberty will be your championship game. I'm really excited for that game. But when you look at Liberty, there are some numbers here that are very interesting. Uh, Liberty is 352nd in tempo, 352nd in average possession length, about 21 seconds per offensive possession, which is crazy to think because it's college, right? It's 30 seconds, right, Drew? It's it's 30 in college. For, for what, Matt? For the a typical possession is 30 seconds, right? It's a 30-second yeah, 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 shot yeah. clock. So they take it down to 21 seconds to 9 seconds a lot of times on offense. Uh, defensively, 323rd possession length here, too. Um, they're really efficient. Sixth in two-point percentage, 28th in two-point percentage defense. They don't turn the ball over either. 14th in least turnover possessions. Uh, so when you look at Stetson, they're 347th in tempo, 342nd in average possession length. So this is going to be played at a crawl. Stetson's a terrible free throw shooting team, 66.5%. They do have five road wins in conference, but none of substance. It's not like they beat North Florida. They do have a road win at Lipscomb, which is not bad, but they're not going into Liberty. Let's go into the two meetings from earlier this season. Back on February 22nd at Liberty, they won 77-49 Liberty did in a 61 possession game. Uh, Stetson made eight twos, eight twos and seven threes. Liberty shot 70% for two-point land. They obviously had the motivation because they lost that game at Stetson. So what happened that January game? January 25th at Stetson, the Hatters, coached by Donnie Jones, used to coach at uh, UCF. Uh, guys who are familiar with college basketball will have heard of uh, Donnie Jones. Stetson won 48-43 in a 54 possession game. Now, I don't know if Ken Palm lists this stuff, Drew, but 54 possessions has to be one of the least possessed games in the country. Liberty made nine twos in that game, seven threes. Stetson shot poorly too, but made eight more free throws. And a game like that, that's going to make the difference. Liberty was up 14 in that game. So if we go off the Ken Palm numbers for this to kind of go with our basis for the line, it's Liberty wins 67 to 51 which is Liberty minus 16, and the total would be about 118. Now, you know if you watch this thing, I don't love unders, but to me, he's predicting a 58-possession game here. Um, 
you'd have to be really efficient on offense to go over a 118 total with just 58 possessions. I think that's pretty crazy. We've seen Liberty struggle at times to cover at home. They only beat NJIT 62-49 at home. Um, they've played some lower-scoring games at home, 63-52 against North Alabama, 54-37 at home against Jacksonville. I hate unders with a passion, but I think the under might be worth a look here. If you're thinking about a 58-possession game that could be a blowout, uh, if Liberty gets out to a big lead, they're going to grind the clock even more. If Stetson can't find their offense right away, then that's going to take more time. Of course, the fouling once again comes into play here because you don't have a lot of margin for error. Um, the 16 here, Stetson might be worth a look once again. And this is the classic, Drew, and I know you know this because you're really good at totals. When you've got a really low total and a really high number, the underdog's worth a look here. A 118 total and you're getting Stetson plus 16, you're starting out 16 nothing up already. In a 118 total, that could see 102 more points, even if Stetson gives their worst offensive effort. Now, I know they lost 77-49 just a couple of weeks ago, but Drew, when you're looking at a 16 with a really low total, isn't that one of the theories you like to look at in totals? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's correlated for sure, a big, a big underdog and a low total. Um, and, and I'm going off of you know possessions, 58 possessions, a point per possession, so... That would put it at 116. So if it's that's what it opens, it, it, it would kind of be tough to bet that one in terms of either over or under. I, I, I would go towards Liberty being the home team, controlling the pace, being the 16, 16 points by pa most power ratings better than Stetson. How, how much do they want to run? You know, it, it would be the main question to me in this handicap of the total, Matt. Well, I don't think that they're not much of a running team. I don't. I wish there was a, a place where we could look for it. That's like the one statistic that Ken Palm doesn't have is fast break points per game. They don't really necessarily want to run. The one thing that is a bit of a worry here is they only won by six against NJ, NJIT two days ago on Tuesday. And Coach Richie McKay talked about afterwards. He was like, look, I don't care how ugly we play. We're just trying to win games and get better for North, you know, North Florida, which presumably will come up uh, this weekend in the conference championship. So he may want to keep starters in a little longer, keep them going a little bit after a subpar effort against NGIT. But even in a subpar effort there, it was 55 to 49. And that still went under the total. I hate totals this low. Because weird things can happen. One weird stretch, a, a, a officiating crew that calls games really tight. Um, what I do, and I have seen before, especially in UVA games that also have low totals, you almost wait till the first TV timeout. See what's going on, and then maybe bet the under then. And I believe I saw it was a couple of games ago. It was the Duke game. UVA Duke had a higher total than a UVA game usually has. Well, I believe by the first TV timeout, it was a 3-3 game. The total was still around mid-120s or so. You jump on the under, it was a, it was a well under game there because it was, you know, it went under the total. Uh, this could be one of those situations where you wait till after the first TV timeout, see how it looks, things like that. Is it 4-2? Is it 6-2? Is there by some chance a big scoring start? Is it like 12-6 at uh, the first TV timeout? Total's a little higher jump in on the under because they're not going to keep that kind of pace up in this game so maybe this is a, a watch and win type situation or find online whatever you want to do in order to watch a liberty stetson game in this situation but you know maybe this is one of those things where you don't necessarily take the under right away you watch a little bit and see how it is i don't think liberty wants to run that's not their style but that's not to say they don't run when the opportunity presents itself but when you've got two teams who are in the bottom Fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, third, way, they're both in the 300s in average tempo and average possession length. You're just not going to see a lot of possessions in this game. Yeah, Matt, I, I, I'm, I'm looking at it now, and there's, there's no way that this, I, I would bet this over. In fact, you know, Ken Palm showing 118. I doubt the market opens up 118. I say they open up this maybe 115 and a half. Um, just, just looking at Liberty, man, the flames aren't going to, aren't, aren't going to run. I mean, they're one of the slowest, if not the slowest team in the country, Matt. They, I mean, Stetson in, in Liberty played on January 25th and the final score was 48 to 43. That, that's that, yeah. And if I look that's here, crazy, man, there, there was only 54 possessions. Neither team is going to look to push it. I, I this is likely going to be a bet for me on the under. 
Yeah, if you look here, so Stetson has played one, two, three, four, four games during conference play with less than 60 possessions. Their last regular season game at home, they played Jacksonville. It was a 53-52 game, and it was a 59-possession game. Now, the one thing to worry about here is they beat North Alabama 82-72, but they were home. But even in that game, they scored 82 points somehow in a 64-possession game. I, I just think if you're playing the numbers here, and let's say it gets to 60 possessions somehow, and you're playing against one of the best defenses in the country, and neither team wants to run, uh, Stetson's not a good free-throw shooting team. No. To me, a lot of the numbers seem like you would look at the under here. But, of course, if we think that, then Vegas thinks that. I'd love it if it was 118, like Ken Palm thinks, but I just don't think it's going to open there. I guess, is there a chance, Drew? I don't know. You look at a lot of these things. Are there people who blindly bet overs in lower total games because they sit there and say, how could this not go over? This total's really low. Sure, there are. I, I've, I've actually been doing shows with guys that say that. and it, It's just, it's, it's a little ridiculous. I mean, it, it's low for a reason. I, I, I wouldn't advise people just to look at totals and be like, oh, it's under 120. But I'm betting the over. Uh, I, that's probably a losing long-term proposition in my, in my opinion mid-major Matt. yeah i i would think so and i don't think anybody's really dabbling in this game if they don't know anything about liberty and stetson so like i i think they don't, this game more than the others that we've talked about drew the number that it opens up with is going to be fascinating and i think if we get a 118 i'm looking at the under if i get anything over than a 118 i'm looking at the under here and then i mean i don't know what the cutoff line is because once again i don't love taking unders and i certainly don't love taking sub 120 unders yeah. but i don't know what the cutoff here is but you know these two offenses don't want to run they don't want to go anywhere they they're both very comfortable at a slower paced game yeah, this has the profile of one i'm going to be on here so uh i'll be watching this these lines uh, pretty closely here mid-major matt uh we're getting up against it uh time wise i mean great information here matt by the way thanks for taking the time man we got uh what best bets guys we got to hit on um also did want to ask your your, your opinion here mid-major matt gonna get to my first college basketball game tomorrow going uh down to the mountain west matchups here at, at uh thomas and mac we got boise state unlv we also got Air Force playing. Air Force got a win, and they're playing, I believe, San Diego State um, here at the Thomas Mac. Any quick opinions here on the Mountain West games here in Las Vegas? Well, I was looking at uh, boy, uh, UNLV there, but the Elijah Mitru Long kid being hurt is going to hurt their offense. These two teams played just a couple of weeks ago at UNLV, and UNLV won 76-66. Um, UNLV opened about a three-point favorite. I see the line and the money is coming in on Boise State a little bit. I like the Broncos a little bit in terms of they shoot the ball really well, but the question is how much of a crowds are going to be, Drew? And I I'll be very fascinated to see. You know, UNLV has had an up-and-down season so but far this hot, year, man. but I'll they're very hot. They're home. I would like to think that even though it's a 2 o'clock game, that they'd get the home field advantage. I don't want to bet Boise State because I don't think they're the home. You know, They're not going to have a home court advantage. I'd like to think that UNLV is going to play up to it here. Uh, if this line keeps going down a little bit, I might look to UNLV. But the injury to that kid who is an offensive presence is certainly going to hurt the runner Rebels. Air Force, I mean, how happy are they going to be after getting one win? San Diego State needs to reestablish themselves as a dominant one seed potential. I feel like there's a chance they may want to come out and, like, you know, beat up on Air Force here. So how happy is Air Force going to be after one win, and how much does San Diego State want to reassert, reassert their dominance? This will be – this number's not out, so I'll be interested to see what the number is when it actually does come out. Yeah, yeah, that one's going to be uh, a little wild here. UNLV – I can tell you it's going to be the running Rebels or pass for me. Not that Boise State's a bad team. I mean, I think they're actually pretty d decent for Mountain West standards. It's just UNLV's won, what, one and covered five straight mid-major, Matt. They, they've been hot. They've been scoring, what, they scored 92 points against San Jose State. San Jose State's not that much, but they scored 80 points against Colorado State. I, I lost on that personally. So, uh, yeah, UNLV's been hot here, man. I, I, and being at home... You know, there's even people talking that they, they, they're going to make a run here and make a shot at the uh, March Madness tournament. Now, they're going to run through some big boys in the Mountain West, like San Diego State and in Nevada, um, if, the, if they can rattle off a couple wins here. But it will be interesting to see. So hopefully, fun atmosphere tomorrow. Mid-Major Matt, awesome stuff, man. We got best bets here for the people. Which way are you going for Thursday's card? Best bet, bro. Well, the best bet, I think, is Green Bay Moneyline. Okay. 
if you're willing to swallow the juice. We obviously don't have a line yet on this game. I think Green Bay wins the game. It's going to probably be around three, three and a half, four. Um, you know, I, I would love to give a best bet on the spread, but we don't know what it is. I think Green Bay beats Oakland. I think Green Bay is a real vi viable threat to win the Horizon League Conference. So best bet's Green Bay money line if you're willing to swallow the juice. Uh, you know, we'll talk about tomorrow on Twitter potentially what the actual spread will be. But I think Green Bay wins tomorrow, and that's my best bet. Okay, so like in Wisconsin, Green Bay, and do you have anything like um, on, on like a cusp of when the line will stop, like, like minus three and a half, minus four? I would like it at three. I mean, uh, three and a half, I think they're still probably good. I, at four, I'm starting to get a little leery uh, with regards to that play because it could be a close game. If if uh, Oakland's able to instill their pace, which I don't think they will, then it will be a close game. They only won by four at Green Bay earlier in the season. Green Bay was up a, a double digits at halftime at Oakland. They're the better team in this situation. That's why I like the money line, definitely. But, of course, if it starts getting high and it starts getting to the 200s, then it's not worth it because no one's willing to swallow the juice there but as of this taping right now green bay money line and then green bay minus three three and a half i would say it's like a two percent play and then higher than that uh, you know i'm not as interested okay. great stuff man green bay uh wisconsin green bay on tomorrow's card liking them three three and a half there against uh what oakland in tomorrow night's card so mid-major mac great stuff as always guys check them out sportsmemo.com remember the coupon code dm49 you can get any handicapper multiple handicappers sportsmemo.com new users 70 dollars off check it out sportsmemo.com